Landing on our screens in 2019, Drive to Survive changed Formula 1 forever. Well, that might be a bit of an overstatement, as arguably there's been plenty of other things that have made a more meaningful impact to the sport, but in terms of bringing in new fans, nothing has quite made the impact that Drive to Survive has. With four hugely popular seasons available and at least two more confirmed, let's take a look at what the show has done for Formula 1. For those of you who don't know, Netflix's Drive to Survive, or DTS for short, is a Netflix documentary series chronicling, well, you guessed it, Formula 1. It's produced by Netflix, Formula 1, and Academy Award winning filmmaker James Gay Reese. The first series premiered in March 2019 and followed the 2018 Formula One Championship. Following on, three equally successful series joined in 2020, 2021 and 2022, each of these premiering in March just before the start of the next F1 season. Each new series chronicled the events of the previous championship season and gave a behind the scenes peek at the massive travelling circus that is Formula One. The show features interviews with drivers, team principals, and for some reason Will Buxton, as well as life in and out of the paddock, interspersed with lovely footage of races. The show was an instant success, mostly because it didn't focus on the technicalities of F1. That's what we have the YouTube channel Chain Bear for. Instead, it focused more on the personalities within the sport, which made the show much more accessible for pretty much everybody. Drive to Survive was exactly what Formula 1 needed in 2019, and here's why. Despite being a multi-billion dollar international enterprise, Formula 1 is actually a fairly niche sport, and it doesn't seem to have the same amount of appeal as the most popular sports, football, basketball, and tennis. Fun fact, F1 doesn't even rank in the top 10 most watched sports. Many people will know the legends like Michael Schumacher and Ayrton Senna, and some may have discovered F1 through 2013's rush depicting the rivalry between Nicky Lauda and James Hunt, but that just shows you that Formula 1's image has been stuck in the past. Even if people are generally aware who Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen are, the season finale of F1 doesn't draw the same crowd that football title matches do. And whilst kids may be still going to school with generic Formula 1 themed lunchboxes, Lewis Hamilton isn't the ubiquitous figure on pencil cases that Schumacher was in the early 2000s. All of this is to say that Formula 1 desperately needed something like Drive to Survive to refresh their image and widen their fan base. And all of that in especially one key location, the United States of America. F1 is and has always been a mainly European sport. There are no American drivers on the current grid, although a few have made their way over the Atlantic in the past. It's been a hot minute since we've had an American world champion, and by a hot minute I mean it's been 44 years since Mario Andretti won the World Drivers' Championship in 1978. And if you've got a really keen ear, you might have noticed, Mario Andretti is not the most American name. He was actually born in what is now Croatia, and didn't move to America until he was 15. But over the past two decades, the sport has been growing in the US. The current race that's under the USGP title is the Circuit of the Americas, which has been on a calendar since 2012. And before that, it was held at the Indianapolis Speedway from 2000 to 2007. The Indianapolis iteration of the USGP isn't exactly remembered fondly, as it was a stage for the fast that was a 2005 race. The US Grand Prix definitely has a history, but it doesn't quite have the same legendary status as Silverstone, Spa, or even the Australian GP. And all of this definitely affects Formula Formula 1's popularity within the US. But why should European fans care that Americans don't watch Formula 1? After all, here in Europe, we don't insist on a European spin-off of the Indy 500. Well, as always, the answer of course is money. Formula 1 is a very expensive sport, which is why teams have paid drivers, and sometimes races take places in countries that are 155th on the Freedom Index. If we wanted to have more races on the calendar, and perhaps even have more new and improved teams, we need to get the Americans involved. And the only way to do that is to get them to to watch the sport. And Drive to Survive did just that. Just look at the US Grand Prix attendance numbers that jumped from 264,000 in 2018 to 400,000 in 2021. Or the fact that 2022 saw the inaugural Miami Grand Prix and in 2023 the Las Vegas Grand Prix will also be added to the calendar. Globally, Drive to Survive introduced F1 to plenty of new fans. In 2021, Nielsen reported that in 2020, interest in Formula 1 grew by 20%, or 73 million in 10 key markets. These include Brazil, China, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, South Korea, Spain, the United Kingdom, and of course, the United States. And 77% of that growth came from the coveted 16 to 35 age group. That same study estimated that by this year, the F1 fan base will reach 1 billion. The numbers aren't out for 2022 yet, but one seventh of the planet watching Formula 1 sounds pretty good. 
And the only personal gripe that I have with the rising popularity of Formula 1 within the US is the time difference. More US based races on the calendar mean more ridiculous airing times for us Europeans, but at most it's a mild inconvenience. As long as they don't add any more Australian races that I have to get up at the crack of the dawn for, I'm happy. Despite or perhaps because of the massive success of the show, it hasn't been universally praised. Sure, it brought in new fans, but once the novelty of the series wore off, the cracks began to show. You see, Drive to Survive is very entertaining for a documentary, and that's because it's not entirely factual. I mean, at times, it feels more like a rip-off of The Office-style mockumentary, with entirely absurd beats like Gunter Steiner's iconic Bunch of Wankers from Season 1. And that also goes with misplaced engine sounds to fake team radios. Drive to Survive has been accused of inventing drama where there simply was none, and fans are right to call Netflix out on their mistakes. And by mistakes, I mean deliberately faking it to make it more interesting. After all, in the words of Daniel Ricardo, Netflix really are a bunch of confused filmmakers. Netflix are a real bunch of cunts, aren't they? A recent example of Netflix inventing stuff comes from the season 4 episode 8 that follows George Russell's move to Mercedes. The first fishy thing here is the audio when Russell says that it's up to Mercedes and Toto to decide whether he ends up in a Mercedes Formula 1 car. This is my last season contracted to Williams. If that means Mercedes and Toto decide whether I end up in a Mercedes Formula 1 car next year or not. If it sounds like it's spliced together from different clips, that's because it is. Then we get Toto Wolf telling Russell that he's got a seat in Zanvor, although in real life, Russell was informed of that decision at Spa. The storyline of that episode was immediately under fire from fans and pundits alike, and Russell was quick to defend the dramatization, saying, People have been very vocal about it, you know, being dramatized a little bit. But at the end of the day, you always want to show the best light of your sport and your story, as in any documentary that there is. Netflix is unique, as long as it's having a positive impact on Formula 1, I think there's no real issue. Russell's move is a fairly innocuous thing to play around with, and it's more funny than anything else, but occasionally, Netflix drops the ball when it really shouldn't. The primary example of this is Roman Grosjean's crash that was covered in Series 3. It had all the drama befitting of a Hollywood blockbuster and none of the grace that a crash like that should deserve. The footage was drawn out, a deafening silence was added, and it was interspersed with mournful voiceovers. It really felt like Netflix were milking this crash for all it was worth. And at this point, I can't wait to see how they're going to cover of Joe's accident at Silverstone in Series 5. But back to the more funny mess ups. In Season 4, Netflix tried to compare Fernando Alonso, you know, the two time world champion Alonso, to Pierre Gasly. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against Gasly. He had a great 2021 season, but comparing him to Alonso and insinuating that there's really any competition is like saying that Red Bull should look out for Williams. And I mean, they should when Verstappen is about to lap Latifi. As you probably gathered, Season 4 was just a fountain of weird editing and invented drama, including Mazepin unlapping his himself in Sochi, being presented as a nail-biting high-octane overtake, and Russell's Rouge footage being used a whopping five times. In fact, many reviews called it the worst season yet. But other seasons had their moments too. According to season 3, 2020 teammate and golf buddies Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz were mortal enemies and fierce rivals, something that both drivers have outright denied. And the list just goes on and on. And fans aren't the only ones to call out Netflix on their mistakes. Max Verstappen has been an outspoken critic of the show since the beginning and has called the show fake, saying, I didn't like that at all because a lot of it is fake. I know what I talked about with my engineers. Some of the things I said in Australia or Austria, they used for another Grand Prix to make it more exciting. That's not okay. That's just sensationalism. Verstappen has expressed his wishes to be withdrawn from the show entirely or as much as the reigning champion can, saying, I understand that it has to be done like this to boost a popular popularity in America, but as a driver, I don't like to participate in this. They fake some of the rivalries that aren't there at all, so I decided not to get involved and not to give interviews, because there's not really anything to show you. I'm not a dramatic show person, I just want to see the facts in actual events. And the powers that be aren't too happy about that, though mainly that's because it's kind of weird to make a sports documentary without featuring your reigning world champion. And they've already tried that. Mercedes wasn't featured in season 1 and Hamilton's absence was keenly felt. Although on the flip side, it allowed Netflix to focus on the more midfield battles that often get overlooked in the race broadcasts. However, apparently Verstappen has seemingly eased up and teased that we might be seeing more of him within season 5. The joke of the fakery has become so much that a promotional video from 
McLaren showed Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo sitting down to watch season 4, and they called out misplaced team radios. However, both are still keen to appear in the show and generally see it as a good influence on F1. And no driver has benefited quite as well as Ricardo has from the success of Drive to Survive. He's just good natured and goofy enough that his Netflix are a bunch of, you know what, comment came across as cheeky and not aggressive. Not to mention that as a self-defined secret American, Danny Rick must be loving the new American audience. Another driver who has nothing but praise for the show is Esteban Ocon, who credits Drive to Survive for helping him get a drive for the 2020 season, saying, I think Netflix has changed a lot of my life, not just the public stuff, but also my career. In difficult times where I didn't have a seat, that came out and people could actually see that I was desperate to have a drive again, and that probably helped for my career to come back. Sergio Perez, whose phone call with Christian Horner in season 3 was suspected to be staged, is also pretty happy with the show. First of all, I really respect Drive to Survive because what it's done for Formula 1 is tremendous. It's really something I appreciate. Honestly, at the beginning, I didn't think it was that big or important for our sport, and then secondly, yeah, they probably create some drama. The way they sell the sport is a bit of drama. It is a show, but at the end of the day, it is good for the sport and good for the fans, so I'm happy with it. Even Lewis Hamilton, who snubbed the first series, has come around and seen the benefits of the show, saying, In this last couple of years, it's been the steepest rise and more and more people are talking about it. More and more people are engaging. Hamilton hits the nail on the head. As dramatized as Drive to Survive is, it keeps people engaged and draws in new fans, and perhaps there lies in the truth. Drive to Survive is extremely fun for people with limited to no knowledge of F1. Even if for existing fans and especially hardcore ones, it can be borderline insulting to hear the sound of a car going flat out whilst it's paired with a visual of someone going through a chicane. And whilst the manufactured rivalries may make for interesting viewing, it's no wonder that fans might get angry when their favourite driver is portrayed in an undeservingly bad light. But even the most diehard fans and Max Verstappen have to admit as a whole, Drive to Survive is good for the sport. It brings in new fans and new fans bring in more money, both directly and indirectly, as higher interest from the public also translates to higher interest from sponsors. In turn, this leads to new races on the calendar and even more comp competition between the teams. Formula 1's image needed a revamp, and Drive to Survive is possibly one of the best promo campaigns the world has ever seen. Let's just hope that they don't mess up Season 5 any more than they messed up Season 4. But with that being said, what do you think of Drive to Survive? I know many people will definitely come into the sport from watching Drive to Survive. Was that you? Let me know in the comments down below. But besides that, I'll see you next video for when I'm going to talk about whether Mercedes can make a comeback.